So welcome everyone to the April 26, 2021 Hadley Public School Committee meeting. Um, is there a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, we have a lot to get to tonight. Um, lots of topics. So any adjustments to our agenda for this evening? Uh, no, we will. One of our action items, the uh, final approval of the FY22 budget will happen uh, after we re-enter regular session, after executive session. That's the only adjustment. Okay, got it. Um, and we will go into executive session as a breakout room. We will keep this general session open and recording, and we will re reconvene at the end in open session for that when we get there. All right. Um, then we're going to move now into the the public hearing FY22 budget overview and revenue and expense summary. Annie. Yes, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, uh, all right, can you see my screen now? Uh, yes, okay, perfect. Um, so much of this is similar, although originally when we first looked at the budget, what the most critical piece for the town has not changed. The town is looking at some significant constraints in fiscal year 22. And as a result, um, the town asked every single department, if possible, to level fund. Our total operating budget is not level funded for next year, but the local contribution is level funded. So it's a $0 increase to local contribution, but the total increase to the budget for next year is about just under 3%. Included in that increase are some expenses which uh, will, we will use the funds from COVID relief, what are called ESSER funds, to support some of the things that we planned for in the budget. And I'll go through what some of those are. In general, um, there's an expectation, of course, that we allocate our resources in a way that demonstrates a commitment to the values that we espouse. Um, and so we have a vision in the district that we want our students to understand and contribute positively to a global society. We want to provide a safe and supportive environment. We value diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we believe that if we continue to build educator expertise and a shared vision around what matters to us, that we will in fact increase student achievement, engagement, and equity for all learners. And our strategic priorities, and these are priorities that we, we, they should look familiar because it's not a one and done. So we revisit these and try to go deeper and do better every single year. So we want every single one of our students to experience a rigorous and aligned curriculum, have effective instruction. We want to assess them in ways that allow us to then improve our instructional practices and foster deep learning for students. We want to make sure that learning environments are safe and efficient, effective for all students. We want to partner with our families to meet the needs of our students. And we want to reflect on our practices. We want to look at data. We want to evaluate, read and evaluate research. And we want to learn from best practices and adapt our practices to achieve our desired results. Some of the investments for fiscal year 22, uh, including additional tech support um, to, as you know, we've done a considerable amount of remote learning this year. We have many, many, many more devices. Mr. Olson has done a phenomenal job keeping up with an intense workload. I'm extremely grateful for all he did last spring, all he's continued to do this year and we need additional support to keep on top of this. We intentionally have listed this as a contracted service because again, we wanna do everything that we can to try to contain costs on the town side. So this um, would mean that there, we would, the town would not incur expenses for uh, health insurance benefits. Uh, supporting, continuing to support our COVID-19 pool testing program. Now we recognize that um, Things may change in the fall, but right now, if you were to ask me, do I see us pool testing next year? Absolutely, I see us pool testing next year. Um, if for no other reason than when cold and flu season comes, to be able to discern whether or not we're seeing an uptick in cold and flu or if we're seeing, um, if we're seeing COVID. Uh, 
we will invest in high quality college and career pathways. So we have many students who pursue chapter 74 education and we pay the tuitions for that. Um, and we need to compensate our faculty for coordinating early college high school innovation pathways as internship programs. And of course, and some of this is operating budget and some of it comes out of a big chunk of it comes out of grant funding. Um, and of course, uh, we've included in the budget, the costs associated with the students taking college courses. Grant funding from the state supports that. So the revenue comes from a grant, but it's still an expense in the operating budget. Um, we certainly wanna make sure that all students have access to a free and appropriate public education. And in some cases, that means that we are tuitioning students into specialized programs and out of district placements. And we need to make sure that we have high quality summer programs. Um, some changes in the personnel realm. Um, so in the secondary teaching faculty, one is replacing the English language arts teaching position. It was formerly held by Ms. Camuso that we did not replace this year. So we just went without, which has been um, a lot of work for the staff at Hopkins. Uh, we are developing a specialized program at Hopkins Academy and in doing so that will mean that um, students, three students whose needs might not otherwise be met at the high school will have the opportunity to uh, learn in our district and remain with us. So that is a cost avoidance strategy and it's about inclusion. Um, we have uh, increases in accordance with our collective bargaining agreements and uh, salary adjustments when regional data has demonstrated that HPS pay scales are significantly less than comparable positions in the region. Uh, resources to support high quality curriculum instruction and assessment. So we have budgeted for um, stipends and we haven't finalized exactly what each one might look like, but we recognize that particularly, and some of this can be supported through some of the um, funds associated with COVID because one of the priorities that the state and the federal government want us to pay attention to is what are the, what have the effects, of, what effects it has COVID had on learning loss? And um, so some of these, some of these activities will be asking teachers to, or asking teachers to apply for what they're interested in um, as stipended positions would be to kind of organize some of that work and help us do that work better. Um, uh, we are looking at um, Project Lead the Way. So we received that grant. It was supposed to be implemented this year and we did not implement this year for obvious reasons. So um, we'll have Project Lead the Way courses. That's a grant that was grant funded. And um, we are exploring the possibility of doing some language learning at Hadley Elementary School. Um, resources to support our commitment to fostering a diverse and equitable, inclusive and anti-racist organization. Um, and there you can see also instructional materials, um, financial support for uh, coaching at schools and program evaluation. It's not every single line item in the budget, but it's a summary of strategic investments. Um, and I'm going to share one more thing which will be the revenue and expense summary. There we are. There we go. So what is the change that we're looking at in terms of revenues? Um, the total operating expenses are equal to the total revenues. Uh, local contribution has not changed. Uh, we will see a decrease in circuit breaker funding the good news for that circuit breaker, just a reminder for the public and the school committee. So circuit breaker is the program that reimburses us for expenses for a student who is with an individual education program who is placed outside of the district when those expenses exceed four times foundation budget. Foundation budget is roughly 11,668-ish dollars. Let's call it 12. So when the cost to educate a student with an individual education program exceed four times that, let's call it 50 grand, $48,000. When they're in excess of that, then Circuit Breaker is a program that reimburses districts. It should, when fully funded, at about 75 cents on the dollar for every expense above that threshold. 
It's subject to appropriation, so it's not always fully funded. The reason we see circuit breaker going down is because as I've said, we're, uh, and this is really a testament to our special education team, to every teacher in the district and our administrators, but we are doing a very good job of meeting the needs of students in our school district and designing programs to meet their needs. So we're seeing a decrease in out of district tuitions. You see additional revenue right now from what's called ESSER funding that's COVID related. That is what's been referred to as ESSER 1 and ESSER 2. So many of you are aware that in the House, on the federal side of things, there's a lot of conversation right now about additional stimulus that cities and towns, states and school districts um, can expect to see. We have an estimate, but we don't have that. We haven't applied for that. We don't have that money, that revenue. All of that revenue isn't shown there right now. Uh, when we have that and that application is completed, we'll update our revenues. Um, we see a slight increase, which is wonderful and somewhat surprising in our Title I, Title IIA and Title IV. So that essentially our Title I program is, uh, we have one Title I school, it's Hadley Elementary School, and it's our specialized reading program at Hadley Elementary School. Um, we anticipate a slight uptick in that 240 grant, that fund code has to do with supporting programs for students with disabilities. You can see we're applying much more school choice money um, and uh, much less preschool revolving money to the operating budget. I probably don't have to explain why that is. Preschool took a tremendous hit last spring and this year through no fault of their own. It had to do with our capacity limitations in our current learning environment. Um, and so, we see a sizable increase in our total non-local revenues. And that, of course, uh, we need that increase because um, we see a, a complete budget increase, revenues and expense increase of just under 3%. Anyone on the school committee have any questions? Hey, Annie, this is Paul. I do um, I appreciate you and being sensitive to the town's request, so I know. Um, Appreciate it. we're doing our part, so thank you. <clears throat> Can you help me understand the COVID funds again? So the American Rescues Plan, there's a National Facilities Council that I've looked at on the website, mm -hmm. and they talk about the amount of money that we would have gotten through SR1 and essentially through the second round. And their numbers are very different than these numbers that I see. That you know, they talk about the first round being 450,000 and the second round being close to a million. Um, but was that second round what you mentioned? That we no, so what you, uh, okay, so what you see on the, what I showed in the revenue chart, Paul, that's an excellent question, are the funds we have right now in hand. Some of those have already been spent. They've already been spent, uh, believe it or not, even though I rolled, no, I take that back. That's ESSER 2 is what's there. I'm sorry, we've already spent some money this year in fiscal year 20. What you're looking at is ESSER 2, that 450 that you're referring to, um, these names aren't helpful, but we've been calling that ESSER 3. Um, the million you're referring to, that is not something that I'm aware of, although I, it could very well be towns are getting their own money. Cities and towns get their own ESSER funding. We have been told that we would get roughly, it was based on our Title I allocation, four times Title I, so that 450, 460 to be spent I, my understanding is right now that they're saying that that can be spent over multiple fiscal years. And the last meeting that I had with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, they cautioned school committees and school districts and said, one, um, make sure that don't rush to spend everything down in fiscal year 22, because you may encounter some surprises in fiscal year 23. We don't know what shape the recovery will take. You may encounter surprises in fiscal year 24. And so that two, roughly 250 that you see there, or 266 that you see there, is what we know in hand, those grants have been approved and we've been given those allocations. The ESSER 3, which you're quoting about the 450, I'm saying 460, is still, I believe, estimate. We'll get that wrapped up and um, on the books by the end of June. We'll know the exact revenue for that. That money can be spent over multiple fiscal years, just to restate, we're, we're advised against rushing to spend it all in one fiscal year. And it is money that could be used for, you said you saw it in facilities, 
some people are talking about is this, do we use these kinds of funds to, for improvements to ventilation, um, right. these kinds of upgrades? So the, I did, but I, I can't tie the answers to the actual stimulus bill. So the most recent one, the American Rescues Plan, that was what, a month ago that sent $1,400 to individuals. That's the one where I thought there was an additional stimulus that, so there's a site here and, and we can talk about this offline. Yeah. It's called the National Council on School Facilities and they mm -hmm. buy school, by state, by school across. And if you go to Massachusetts, it says we should be getting $990,000 from that. By state, by school. And it says Hadley should be getting $990,000. Hadley School District, that's in addition to the 450. So that's why so I, that I would have to, I am unfamiliar with that. And I'm wondering if that also includes, are they specifically saying school district or is that also the town's money as well? So it says Hadley School District. So, I mean, maybe they're getting it wrong. Um, and then this is the one where they say 20% has to go to offset learning loss. Um, but there is there, what's interesting is that there's no strings attached to the rest of the money. Mm -hmm. and it can be used on things like facilities. Um, right. This, it's confusing. I, I can't track what the ESSER is tracked to which stimulus bill, and which we know how much money we have received, right? Right. So when you see the ESSER funding that you're looking at in the revenue summary, that is grants are, we know, we see, we know our allocation. We've been told of our allocation. We can see it. Those grants are either uh, approved already or on their way to being approved. And then when you're talking about America Rescues, I'm calling that ESSER 3, um, that when we uh, have those grants, which will be before June 30, when we have those applications uh, finalized, we can bring an update on those revenues to the school committee. The additional $990,000 you're referring to, honestly, I'll tell you, and you're saying that's in a facilities website or on a government website, on DESE's website? It's not on DESE's website. So maybe so it's called the National Council on Facilities, School Facilities. So they're advocating I, yeah. that they're, basically their point is to it's a database that they've distilled from they think from the federal allocations sure. and I think it's based on they've got our school enrollment pretty accurate they say we have 529 yeah. kids so they have some limited data and they they estimate what we've spent before but they say the American Rescue's plan um, which I hear you saying I think is SR3 is 998 the COVID relief bills before were 444 and I can share with you we can have a call tomorrow to talk about this it just seems like um and then they have a 199 i just want to make sure that we're capturing all the federal funds but is there anything active we have to do to secure these federal funds or does it just come to us no we always have to complete even when it's an allocation we call those entitlement grants there's two types entitlement and competitive even for every single entitlement grant we fill out, Chris and I have to do an application for every single one of our entitlement grants. Yeah. And so I am happy. I also, just so the public knows, I will bring an update back in May on those revenues to the school committee. I'll explore that further. But the reason I asked you that question, so our allocations, where we submit our application and where we find our allocations, which actually, that is on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education website. That's, right. that's where we get the applications. That's where the requests for proposals and applications are posted. We submit them there. And that's where, if there are allocations that the public can view, that's where they would be posted. Gotcha. It's confusing. So I may be getting some of this wrong, but that. Um, I'll, I'll certainly, if, if they know about a million bucks, I don't know about, I, I'm all over it. Paul. It's I, under the couch. <laughs> it's, you know, yeah, who knows? Yeah. All right. question and good points, Paul. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I don't know if you noticed, but um, ever since that um, bill got passed, we started getting emails from all kinds of vendors vying for how we spend that money. So it's not surprising that um, different agencies are pitching uh, their solution, in this case, a facilities oh. solution, which you know we just have to take a step back and see what's right for our, our district. Oh, left side, left side. Yeah, did notice that. So Annie, our next steps on this is, this is what we'll be voting on in executive session. And um, given the outcomes of that, what is approved will then move forward into the um, annual town meeting in terms of the, the budget that we put forward to the town. 
Correct. The town at annual town meeting, the town simply votes local contribution. Right. Okay. And that this, this is what it is based upon mm -hmm. in terms of our, yes. our allocation. Okay. Yes. All right. And anything else on this before we move then to the next um, agenda topic? I don't. Okay. I don't. All right. Um, so our next topic is public comment. We do have some public here tonight. And so I will just open up that panel and uh, we will open up for public comment at this time. If you would like to make public comment, please go ahead and raise your digital hand and um, we can uh, ask you to unmute. I see Tony Fiden. I will ask you to unmute so that you are able to make your public comment. Go ahead. All right, how, how are you? Thanks for uh, hosting tonight. Welcome. My uh, my video will not start, so um, I guess you'll just have to go without the video. Anyway, I wanted to speak briefly about an item that um, that I did not realize was on the agenda tonight, and, and that is the anti-racism statement. And um, this is something that, um, well, related to that, what's been bothering me for some time is the what I see as a hyper political politicalization that's kind of overtaken our schools. At least that happens where my daughters attend. It's um, it's been, you know, it's been going back to last year where every single class, whether it's AP language or it's art history, will will um, uh, revolve around current politics and mostly racial politics. And it's um, it, it's obviously intentional. It's it's been done for for reasons. I don't I don't think it's helpful. I don't think it's it's getting the our, our children's ed education done. I think it's and. I think parents are noticing it. I know students are noticing it. It's sometimes it's it's kind of worth, worth parody. It's, it's that obvious where things are just circled back to politics and um, current political issues. But what what um, what brought me here tonight was um, related to the anti-racism statement. And that said, I saw a um, a job posting. Someone forwarded a job posting from the Hadley Public Schools to me. And it was interesting in that the job posting, other than a brief mention that the applicant should be certified to teach in Massachusetts, it included nothing about the school, nothing about its student body, its history, or the personal qualities an applicant should have. What it did include was a kind of a laundry list of identity groups and a, and a requirement that the applicant, and this is a quote, demonstrate a commitment to creating diverse, equitable, inclusive, and, and, and anti-racist learning environments. And it's the last part of that sentence that's problematic to me. It's, uh, the, the posting even included a link to the school committee's um, anti-racism statement, and which was presented and approved um, at a meeting last August. And um, the reason that's problematic to me is that I spent a lot of time over the last few months looking into what an anti-racist education really means. And in my view, it's incredibly divisive. It's, it's, it's based on fundamentally flawed race-based assumptions. It actually demands that we make judgments based on people's character, uh, about people's character, and we treat people differently based on their race. Um, and there's a name for that, and, and it's not anti-racism. And, and this anti-racism ideology is not new. At this point, we're seeing it. It's it's kind of taking hold across the country, and um, it's really it's 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 done a lot of damage. I, and we don't have to look any further than Smith College to see how this ideology when incorporated into policy it can destroy careers damage reputations it pits groups against one another and this is all unfolding before our eyes and it's i just want to see us avoid that same fate and i think this job posting that i mentioned earlier illustrates how far off track we've gone because we're actually demanding fealty to a political ideology i'm not even sure if that's that's legal it's it's not right in my view to to Put a political document and that's what this is it's an ideological document it's not a policy statement it's the definition of ideology just want to be clear about that and um i think that's very problematic to me and um to illustrate that uh, there was a group of uh, black scholars uh led by civil rights leader robert woodson and they, he, they recently wrote an open letter um, about smith college employees who were forced to undergo anti-racist training and the letter reads, I'll just read one uh, couple sentences. It says, please consider that many black Americans find training that reduces us, meaning black Americans, simply to a racial category, profoundly condescending and dehumanizing. 
Not only do such activities often increase racial animosity rather than reduce it, but they also deeply harm students of color by teaching them to process every one of life's difficulties through the lens of race. And that's, that's their view. And that's, that's the ideology that you've embraced and you've embraced for the town of Hadley. Um, and I, I urge you to read the entire letter. You can just search for Robert Woodson open letter to Smith. And as I said, this letter was signed by 44 black scholars and some of them like Woodson are legendary figures. They're, they're from Columbia and Brown. They're from the Frederick Douglass Foundation. There's authors, journalists, theologians. And I was, and it struck me as I was thinking about this, that these individuals, despite their accomplishments and their life experience, they would not be welcome to teach any subjects in the Hadley Public Schools simply because they believe, as I do, that this anti-racist agenda actually harms people. That's a, I know that a lot of people feel differently on this, on this board, but that's their view. And that's, I think they have a right to that view and not be left out of the consideration for a job in Hadley. So what I'd like you to do, and I'm, I'm wrapping up, I know I'm, I'm going to be quick. Uh, I'm going to put the question to you, Dr. McKenzie, and to uh, Principals Camuso and Dowd, and to all the school committee uh, members as individuals. And if you can explain to me, and actually not to me, to, to the people of Hadley, why these 44 accomplished Black scholars are not welcome to teach middle school English at Hopkins. And it, I mean, it is a real question, not not a not rhetorical. It's because this is the system we've created. Uh, it's, and it's on every teaching job posting that I, that I saw. And it, by the way, this is we're, this is unique to Hadley. I looked at Amherst, Northampton, South Deerfield. There's nothing like this it's, it's, it's a, that will link to a political document. And um, I think you can tell, I think it's a, it's a big mistake in it. But if, I'd, I'd really like an explanation of that. Are you to consider, can, consider how you would explain that? I don't know if you can, but if you can explain it, I think we need to we need to start over and take another look at this, at at what the actual implications of this would be. Because as I, as I said, this is a political document on our every job posting, and you're you're, you're saying to, and I, I know there was just a few poll that about 45 percent of Americans have a problem with with some of the things that are in that our, our statement. I, I don't know if that's a good idea to have that up there as our defining document of our school and uh, really our town, because when people look at the town, that's the first thing they go to is, is the school. Uh, um, so I'm hoping you'll consider that. Look at that as a real question. How, how do you explain that to those 44 black scholars that because of their strong beliefs, they're not welcome to teach in Hadley. And I'll just, uh, just on a final point, I, I'll just note that I, I grew up in Hadley, and um, I've also had the opportunity to live all over the state, you know, the different parts of the state. And I know this, that Hadley is far more forward thinking, far more inclusive, and far more, far more welcoming and tolerant than we've, than we're ever given credit for. And that's just, a, you know, there's kind of a stereotyping that, that takes place regarding a, a farm community. It's just, uh, you know, we kind of learn to live with that. But my point is that we don't need this this type of ideology here. We can do better. We, we, we've done better without this. And this this will only serve to divide us. We can, we can work together. We don't have to just because something's sweeping the nation is kind of a pop um, pop culture thing. And it's even in, and I know there's funding for it right in our budget now, but we can do better than this. And Hadley is better. And I think we, we deserve better. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping you lead us to a better place on this. Thank you. I'll be glad to answer any questions. I know these are strong statements, either later or, or now. So if you ha um, if you do have any questions, I'll, I'm, I'm glad to answer or discuss it. But thank you. Thank you for your comments. And I know you've you've spoken with us previously about the um, cultural response of curriculum scorecard. Uh, while we may not uh, directly address Q&A during our public comment, um, I know that I appreciate your framing that we can take into this first agenda topic around uh, the update on diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism working group um, and, and have that uh, framing that you've provided for us. So I appreciate you um, sharing your public comments. Thank you. I'm
going to now ask, we're still in public comment, if there are any others uh, public that would like to participate in public comment, please go ahead and raise your digital hand and we can hear from you. Okay, seeing none. Uh, we will then move out of public comment and into our presentations and discussion items. And our first one is uh, from Dr. McKenzie, update on diversity, equity, inclusion, and the anti-racism working group uh, for the public schools, as well as the anti-racism resolution. Yes, and uh, I will say thank you, uh, Heather, for pointing out we don't do Q&A in public comment, but I do want to assure uh, Mr. Fiden that I will personally follow up with you um, uh, this week. Tomorrow, I'll personally reach out to you. Um, so in regards to this update, uh, as was pointed out, the school committee adopted this resolution last summer. And I think it's critical that um, when a committee resolves to do something, I feel it's my obligation as your employee to inform you of efforts in the district to try to make sure that what we've stated as priorities and what we've resolved to do to share with you the efforts uh, that we've made to make progress. Um, and so some of those efforts include, I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, so the highlighting I did just to help connect some of the efforts with some of the statements. Um, so one thing is about providing um, training to all district staff, school committee members, professional development on diversity, equity, and inclusion, to recruit and retain a diverse and culturally responsive teaching workforce, and examine practices for institutional systemic racialized practices, implement uh, policies, sustainable policies that are evidence-based when change is needed, um, and also incorporate into, into the curriculum history of racial oppression through works of diverse um, authors and the perspectives of Black, Indigenous, Latino, and other authors of color. And so what um, some of the work that we've done is, and again, this is not to indicate that our work is done. These are just efforts that are currently underway. Um, so I shared with the school committee some examples. And as I said, these are not meant to be, an ex this is not an exhaustive list, but rather an illustrative list. Um, so what are some of the ways we've provided professional development just this year? Um, recruiting and retaining a diverse and culturally responsive teaching workforce. And I wanna be clear that all educators can be culturally responsive educators, but I did wanna provide the school committee with data in terms of student demographics in each of the buildings and staff demographics in each of the buildings. Um, and uh, as was discussed, um, so we did look at the hiring practice practices in some other districts, uh, some of the information that districts provide to candidates, uh, interview questions, um, how we might get an understanding of an individual's experience with diversity, equity, and inclusion, how might you um, differentiate instruction to ensure that all different kinds of learners could access the curriculum, could access instruction. Um, I have a meeting with uh, Dr. Beverly Bell, who's an assistant dean at UMass Amherst, um, to talk about how we might partner to try to increase diversity in the workforce. Um, and I have actively now reached out to colleges uh, a lot of, we get a lot of, we're very fortunate student teachers that are placed in our district and I appreciate all the teachers who take them on. Um, and I've reached out to some colleges. Most of them come just from Hampshire County. So I've specifically recently reached out to teacher education programs in Hamden County as well to um, try to get folks from different areas uh, into our buildings. We have the Collaborative for Educational Services that's working right now and helping us think about how we might collect uh, some data. Both we have access to quantitative data to take a look at whether or not um, our practices and our policies are 
if we're seeing kind of a disproportionate impact of a practice or a policy on a certain group of students on any or staff. And also uh, they're going to work with us to try to collect the voices, people's experiences um, to get a sense of what is it like? Um, what is for, and this is from all students. So how are they experiencing day-to-day -day interactions in school? How are they experiencing um, some of what the speaker brought up? How are they experiencing the curriculum? How are they experiencing instruction? This is to ask all students and all faculty. And, um, and we've done some incorporation of uh, different kinds of projects and resources into the curriculum and in instruction um, to make sure that we that students are learning about and hearing about the experiences of all different kinds of people. And um, that we ensure that a, a big piece of this is ensuring representation. So when we look at the re instructional resources that we have available, who's represented in those instructional resources, whose experiences are we talking about? Are we talking about only one or uh, disproportionately talking about a particular group's experience? Are we making sure that, that we're including the experiences? And this isn't solely an issue of race and ethnicity, but even I say all the time, when we look at our curriculum resources, do we, do we, make, do we see students and people whose physical abilities are different um, who are differently abled in the curriculum um, in our instructional resources. So we just started and we're talking about it, but I felt that the school committee should have an update. Um, so these things, so you don't think that these things are just passed. And then, because we did have another person during public comment ask that question just a few months ago, um, what's going on with that? So I wanted to bring it to the school committee. And that was meant as informational only. Thanks, Annie. Any reactions from folks or questions? No, I would like to um, thank you, Annie, for um, truly sort of um, taking apart and bringing forth strategies that might be right for our district. Um, one thing I think about a lot, and I, uh, I know this is a from a book that April recommended actually. Thank you, April, for recommending Despite Best Intentions. You mentioned that you had been introduced to that in your PhD program and uh, we did um, choose that book as part of a book reading in the community. And, and then I, as I understand it at the elementary school, um, educators have um, taken on. There are a couple of points in there that were really salient for me. And that was that um, without even knowing it, um, there was a disproportionate um, level of um, discipline issues for people of color. Um, I see you nodding your head, Ethan. I'm sure you saw have seen this in, in uh, many of your K-12 experiences. But, um, but just as a result of some of the biases that we are all scientifically proven to have, um, that the... Um, the way in which we interact with our students results in um, infractions, minor and then major, and then you know self-esteem issues and all kinds of things that ultimately are slippery slope. Um, so one key question I have is, um, when can we begin to measure um, discipline um, and how it relates to demographics, uh, so that we're actually, you know, we can't we can't change what we can't measure. So starting to measure those things so that we're aware of how we're doing and can track that year after year. Thank you. That's helpful. Well, I appreciate you assembling this information, Annie, and linking it directly back to the statements that we had um, outlined in the resolution. Any other questions or comments on this? I'll just, I'll just come in and say, you know, again, thank you for doing this. And, and I think it's a, it's absolutely a step in the right direction. And, and all of the work that um, the two schools have been doing, a lot of the committees have been doing, and, and some of the things that you've outlined, um, meeting with Dr. Bell and, and 
these partnerships with the colleges and universities, I think, um, again, go a long way to kind of making that kind of change that is not just, you know, talked about, but we're actually, you know, putting pen to paper and then actually doing the work. And I really like that. Great. Okay. I just want to, uh, can I, can I just add one more thing? Yeah. Um, just popping up a level strategically. Um, I think that it's easy to forget that um, our town is not immune to some of the racial struggles that we've seen around the nation. And um, each town is a microcosm of uh, what's happening elsewhere. And while the public may not be aware of the issues that happen in our school, um, between students, um, uh, between any stakeholders, um, you should know that indeed they do happen. And when they happen, it's damaging to um, people who receive that. Uh, it's damaging to the people who might be um, doing those kinds of things. Um, and it's our responsibility to ensure that uh, the students that we graduate are uh, responsible, whole citizens capable of interacting in the world outside of Hadley and that we are preparing them to be able to do that. So thank you, Annie and April and Jen Dowd for making sure that we um, are creating exactly such a culture. Thanks, Yamira. Um, I, I do want to just mention, you know, one of the, the comments from public comment was around the job application and um, a perceived, you know, lacking of information about our schools and yet having the link, obviously, to our anti-racism resolution in there. So our commitment to um, that aspect of, uh, of our schools and, and our um commitment to the anti-racism resolution. My, my I guess my question would be whether it is worth taking a look. Uh, I don't know whether that's Annie, April, or um, Jen at those positions in terms of, is there anything else we need to do to round out that description to help ensure that we are fully describing the nature of our district, our, our town, our community, as well as our commitment to um, maintaining this uh, effort in support of an anti-racism uh, environment. I'm certainly, I'm happy to look at that. Some of the anti-discriminatory language at the, uh, on any job description, as you know, is the equal opportunity employment language, which yep. people would see in any job descriptions or postings anywhere. So your equal opportunity employment language is typical. I did link the school committee's resolution. I felt like that was useful for applicants to know that the school committee had stated this commitment. Um, and I am happy to your point, Heather, to also look at um, even just Hadley Public Schools, making sure the link to the website is there. Um, and uh, I can link to a kind of a snapshot of Hadley Public Schools as well. So people can see that as well. Yeah, I think, you know, we've done so much work in talking about the um, material and information that we use to encourage school choice, right? So in a similar way, we're talking about material and information to encourage um, why folks would want to work here. Mm -hmm. And I think that it goes hand in hand that um, we can also lead with, with those messages about what a special place and opportunity that it is um, for an educator. Okay. Great idea. I'm happy to do that. Anything else on this topic? All right. Um, for once, the sun is like shining and it's right in my eyes. So I'm trying to <laughs> reposition. This is great. I shouldn't complain. It means summer's coming, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to move on to the next topic then, prom and senior events. Thank you. And it's just me tonight. Miss Duncan um, is home. I told her I, I could handle it so she can uh, do the other things she has to do. So in terms of prom, I believe you guys have the plan ahead of time, but I can summarize just some highlights of that for everyone. So we did take our prom plan to the Board of Health in Hadley, which they approved it and did not have any concerns about it. We did move the prom from Holyoke 
to Hadley in order to just be able to work within our town in our departments. Um, that actually ended up working out really well. They're going to be at the Hadley Meeting House, but the Delaney House is still catering that. So um, they still have that partnership with the Delaney House as well. The way that prom is going to look is that it's juniors and seniors. It's going to be under 100 people, which is within the confines of the state. And if those juniors and seniors don't wish to attend, then they will open up some slots for some students that might have guests that are outside of those grades, as sometimes happens, um, or outside of the school. So they have a wait list that they are hanging on to in case those spaces are made available. Staff, of course, will be supervising as they always do, though they will have some extra jobs this year that they may not normally have, checking people in and then doing some supervision, especially around dancing, which might be one of the things that people are wondering about around dancing. So students can dance with masks on. However, we are having them dance in small groups only. So they'll dance by table assignment for short periods of time. That will help us should we need to contact race at all and just keep the volume of people small on the dance floor. Of course, if someone doesn't wanna dance, they can kind of wave on and move to the next table rotation and just go through that as many times as possible. So I'm sure that will be interesting, um, but it's what we felt like we need to do to have them be safe and still have them dance. Maybe they'll do some fun line dancing too. We'll just have to see how it goes. In terms of eating, they'll be six feet apart at the table and then the tables themselves uh, will be six feet or more apart as well. Dinner will be plated for the students. They have to leave their masks on except for when they're eating, or when they're in a designated area for photographs. Um, the venue will have hand sanitizer and other things of that nature. There's signage in the venue. I'm trying to remember if there's any other highlights. I think those are the main, the main highlights. Miss Duncan does have more exciting information if people wanna know it about decorations and things like that. Um, if Bobby's around, he might have it too. He's, he's on the committee, but I just have the exciting logistics of the health plan. So I can answer any questions about that or if you guys have any feedback around that, prom is happening on May 8th. So any of that would be helpful sooner rather than later. Ms. Camuso, I simply have to say, I find the whole image of table by table line dancing probably the best part about this that I've heard, better than the decorations. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just glad we're not like in the middle of a, you know, reenactment of Footloose with, you know, <laughs> let that's, them what, that's exactly what came to mind, Heather. I know. It is, no dancing. It, it seems like a compromise. Um, you know, certainly there are some concerns about dancing. It is high risk and they are close contact. So we felt like this was a safe way to do that. We tried to think of the way the athletics were thinking about things that they were doing. So I guess we use that to inspire us. Got it. I, 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 did was a, my, oh, sorry, I just had a quick question about cost. Um, you know, I think about, I, I'm hoping that this is a kind of event where, you know, folks feel like they can go and hang out with their friends and that it's not, you know, prom, I need a date, prom, you know, that kind of event. And so my question about that, just given this is like a celebration, right? We're trying, it's, it's a step towards, giving kids the, the normal high school experience. And I didn't know whether the cost of this is covered through like class accounts or whether students are expected to pay for this. And if students are individually expected to pay, because I understand there's a cost with the meal and the facilities and all that, whether or not there are any, you know, fundraising opportunities so that I just don't want cost to become a barrier it's hard enough with prom when, uh, you know, I don't have a date becomes the barrier. And in this case, it's like, forget that. You don't need that. Come hang out with your friends because there's no, you know, dancing in that way anyway. So can we, is there anything that can be done to make sure cost isn't a barrier? So students have always paid for prom um, individually. They have not, not in the time I've been at Hopkins ever raised money to attend prom, the junior class puts it on and it's uh, something that they try to just break even if not lose money every year that they throw it. I think the goal of the current class is to break even. If they lowered the ticket price, then they would just be losing money. In terms of students who might have some financial hardships, 
we make other arrangements for those students when needed, or the class officers might do that as well. So we do have those conversations, um, but the general tickets themselves have always happened that way. I guess this year might also be challenging for, for fund, fundraising in general. That's been pretty tough for a lot of classes, but certainly it's something that we can talk more about and I can talk to the class officers about and, and what that looks like because prom is one of the only things that is not covered by those class dues and fundraisers that they do throughout the years. Most of those funds go towards senior year and graduation events rather than prom, but we can certainly look into you know, how they do that over time and if that's the best use of, of their funds. Well, I can, I just to add to that, Heather, I, um, you know, our students haven't been around one another. There's been no opportunity to have social relationships. And so, yeah, the whole, you know, having a date and, and having it, you know, even going as a group of friends becomes challenging in that scenario. And so it's probably less about being able to afford it and probably more like, I'm not going to, go to something that's going to be weird because I don't have a date and it doesn't look like it's supposed to look like. Um, so I'm just going to, you know, I won't pay and I won't go is what you may get. And perhaps you'll get people who go that have been socializing and haven't necessarily been being socially distant. So I, I like the idea of exploring alternate strategies to really encourage um, that celebration. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned, April, that there are some options for folks who, for whom cost may be a barrier, because that, that was really just my only point in this is that I don't want cost to be a barrier for the, the reason why somebody is not going and, and having this be part of their high school experience. So, so everybody said this is uh, May 8th. How, how have signups gone so far? I am just pulling up the registration. It looks like we have 48 registered so far. Nice. So I'll check in with Ms. Duncan about that again, um, but that looks pretty good. So does so, the 100 include the chaperones? Yeah, that would include them. And in terms of the number of students, we have less than 80 juniors and seniors. So that's a good amount of them so far. And then if, if some of those students don't go, some of these other students have guests who aren't juniors and seniors at Hopkins who would be interested in attending as well. And you said people from other schools could have come at their space? Yep. I guess I would just encourage, you know, looking at how we did with basketball, right? An indoor sport where you had 10, the refs, 12 people sort of within six feet and across the region at higher COVID numbers, everything was fine. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, maybe there's a little bit more leniency about the dancing because that does sound a little uh, anti loose to be honest. I mean, it's a little uh, not exactly how you uh, anybody wants it. So maybe there's a little bit more leniency where people could actually dance. Yeah, I know that we're going to check out the venue. I think one of the challenges is that different venues have different sized dancing spaces unless they get sure. really creative and they use... Yeah. Uh, another space. I know the space itself is large and our numbers aren't super large. So maybe they can go outside of, you know, the dance floor. So I'll follow up with Miss Duncan and see what that looked like. You know, when we were looking a couple years ago, the current seniors had selected Wyckoff because the dance floor was huge and they all wanted to dance. So that I know that is <laughs> important to that group of students uh, and they had not selected the Hadley Meeting House for that reason. Sure. So we can definitely take a look at it. I'll follow up with Miss Duncan, see what the kids found out, and then you know run it by the the Board of Health again if we make any changes. Thanks, April. I know this is like this is probably not an option, but is there any chance to take that that dance party outside? I know that it's mostly just parking lots over there, but yeah, um, one of the things Miss Duncan was checking was you know uh, well I don't know if everyone knows, but there's that sort of wall of windows along the side and she was going to double check to see if any of that opened up because mm. that certainly helped that. And there is that grassy area out there as well. So I'll follow up with her in the prom committee. I just, I'm glad I don't have to be the dance police on this because that's, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry for the person who has to do that. School committee actually will have a table there and be expected to get up, but there are a lot of time dance. to do line dancing. So, Paul, I expect you to Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. I mean, we're just happy that we're able to bring them a, a safe prom and a fun prom and, yeah. you know, that they get to enjoy that. I know they were really sad about losing that last year. That's great. 
any other questions about prom before I just, I, I don't have too much to add about graduation and senior events right now. Uh, they're not much different than last time, but um, we mostly have the final week sort of solidified. So we'll be sharing that with students soon around graduation rehearsal times, seminars, senior breakfast, the ATS walkthrough, and all of those different things. And then we're wrapping up the graduation registration too. So if everyone can remember to complete that by Monday the 3rd, that would be helpful. I will be emailing people back too to make sure that the names I have correspond accordingly. So I will do that with everyone. And uh, hopefully we are still working on the live streaming piece of that. I know that Mr. Sudnick has been working on it with athletics. And so that's sort of our, our trial run. And he's working very hard to make that happen accordingly. So if we can get that sorted out, we can live stream graduation and class night will be for students, only a few staff and a few juniors who are getting awards that evening. And we should not have any problems live streaming that one. And if a family has more than six uh, guests that they wanna bring, can they add an extra name and is there a wait list in case spaces open up? So we don't have a wait list for that right now. The, the current rule of six is just sort of across the board. Those numbers already add up to higher than the state is allowing for outside gatherings. Mm -hmm. So in the original plan before DESE provided their guidance, we had a wait list to try to go above the two, which brought us to the max of the state. With the current one, since we're already over that, we're not taking any extra um, guests beyond the six that are allotted, even if another guest doesn't use all of their six, which so far the majority are, but not all. So question, I guess, on the, the logistics, because you've got three um, school committee members here with graduating seniors. Are we counted in our six or are we counted with administration? I wasn't sure which, where you guys put us? Uh, you guys would be counted within the six. Got it, thank you. Yep. Now, of course I say that Paul, and if a whole bunch of people picked two people and we ended up being way under the state limit, then that might be a different, different kind of subject, but we'll run the numbers and see where things are at. Are we at risk of being over the state limit? Yes, with six per student, we are, but that's within the DESE's guidance. So it's not in violation of the state um, gatherings. Perfect. Great. Any questions about graduation? All right. And Spirit Week this week has been great so far. It sounds like the return today. Kids got to wear their PJs. That's right. And seniors are in the lead as they often are with seventh grade, seventh grade behind, who also tends to generally have a lot of spirit coming in as well. Well, I don't know whose brilliant idea it was to make the Monday after break pajama day, but that was perfect for uh, the return, you know, re-entry into the full day schedule. That was all the kids, I think. They're always, they're very good at knowing which day should be what. They just, they know what everyone's going to want to do and it's Monday after break and everyone just wanted to wear pajama pants. So that's what they did. All right. Great. Okay. Anything else on this? All right. We'll move on then to the advisory uh, for Juneteenth, which leads into um, also calendar discussion. Correct. Annie? So folks looked at the calendar before and we had essentially established a start date. Let me let people know that. But the we have an advisory from the legal counsel to the school committee uh, that uh, both according to the Mass Secretary of Commonwealth's website and an advisory released by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, Juneteenth is to be observed on June 19th each year. If it falls on a Sunday, the holiday will be observed on the following Monday. If it falls on a Saturday, the holiday is to be observed on the Saturday on which it falls. Next year, if we have no snow days, the last day of school for students is the, hold on, 17th, I believe, to make sure I'm looking at the right calendar, is the 17th. That assumes no snow days. However, that's a Friday. Uh, if we have any snow days, then we would, Monday would be a holiday, June 20th. June 19th is on a Sunday. June 20th would be a holiday, and the snow days would be in that following week. 
Um, so the calendar tonight now includes our start days for faculty and students. We have staff returning on the 27th, a Friday of August, and having professional development on Friday the 27th and Monday the 30th. Students return Tuesday, August 31st. We have three additional professional development days, uh, one in October um, and one in May and one in March. And then the last day of school, 180th day would be that June 17th. It is rare that we don't have any snow days, so you can probably assume. And we always suggest that parents plan for five snow days. We don't always use five snow days, but that actually puts us pretty close to the end of June next year. Okay, so this is an action item for us because we will need to um, vote to approve this updated calendar for the 21-22 uh, school year. Are there any questions on the calendar? I should also just point out for the public, it's by design that you don't see yet open house, parent conferences, because we're also waiting to see what changes and what the guidance are is rather around those things. So those are still school days, just how we do them and how that relates to half days uh, that could be adjusted, but we'd have that information out in the summer. Got it. All right, if no questions, is there a motion then to approve the updated 21-22 calendar? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you, Annie. Um, moving then on to the school start time working group and the bill uh, 2548. Yeah, so I just wanted to bring something, bring circle back with the school committee on something that we had talked about pre-COVID, which was looking at school start time. And we had a small working group that included parents and some faculty from both buildings. Many of you may know that both Northampton and Amherst will be having a later start for high school students next year. And I believe, Paul, you can correct me, you might know one of those better than I, but I believe it's right around 8.30 in both cases that high school start around 8.30. You're nodding your head, so I don't think I'm too far off with that. Um, we had talked about the fact in Hadley that uh, the last time we had this discussion, we um, said that we could, the most one cost effective way and secondly a way that would also have another benefit which would allow staff who are shared between buildings to have a more logical schedule and allow our teachers across the district to collaborate would be if we got our start times as close together as possible we're a small enough district that we can run what's called a single tier so right now what happens is high school students are middle high school students hopkins students are picked up dropped off and then the buses go out and make a very similar loop and pick up elementary students. That's called two tiers of busing. In a single tier model, you have just, you run one tier. And so all students can get on the bus um, on all the buses that you need to make sure that you don't go over to capacity limits. And then we would drop off when we walked through this plan before, we would drop off at Hopkins um, and then we'd go drop off at Hadley Elementary School. Hadley Elementary School in that model would potentially start a little bit later than it does now, uh, not significantly, and Hopkins Academy would start about an hour later. I don't want the public or the school committee to think this is something that we are voting on tonight or not even close to that. Um, but I just wanted to remind people that the, the big concern, if I recollect, was around the idea of single tier busing. The only way you get around single tier busing, um, unless you start your elementary school an entire hour later, disrupt that schedule, the only way that you get around single tier busing would be potentially to almost double your transportation costs. Um, I personally, and I respect um, those in the community and some parents who have reservations and questions about it, um, I. Single tier busing doesn't concern me. Our students, the late bus goes to the elementary school. We rarely, uh, I'd be hard pressed to think of examples where Hopkins students are wreaking havoc for Hadley elementary students. Um, that's not to say sometimes we don't have havoc on the bus, but they like to keep it within their own school. 
so they don't they don't extend they don't cross school boundaries to wreak havoc they wreak havoc with each other with the folks they know so we just have not had evidence that would suggest that there's an increase in stress or danger when we mix grades and ages on the bus. Um, but I want the community to hear if there's something, um, my, my thoughts are we revisit this topic again as a topic next month. Um, and if people have concerns and I'll even put something in the, in the um, weekly newsletter, there are things that, that folks would like the school committee to consider whether in terms of, if they have strong opinions about this, any part of it, later start, no later start, um, please reach out to us. Uh, again, I don't want people to hear me saying this is we're on some path. We're definitely going to change something. We started this conversation pre-COVID. Our two neighboring districts have moved to a later start. And um, I just want to get it back on folks' radar. Thanks, Annie. I think the the one comment I have around the the bus um, single tier single combined routes I guess is what it is is um, you know whether or not you've talked about the bus monitor as a role you know I would look to some of your um, students to fill those roles you know in terms of um, your promerito students your key club students your students who are looking for volunteer work, your Girl Scouts looking for the merit project. I mean, those are some immediate ideas that come to mind in terms of being able to serve as a role model in that in that particular position and help bridge the gap between um, the different age groups on the bus and have some responsibility about, um, you know, peer uh, behavior and not have it be another adult that's necessarily on the bus in that role. So just a thought as, as parents start to think about um, concerns they may have around that, that we may have some, you know, really good, uh, you know, young but mature enough students who could fill that role in a very helpful way. There are so many, Heather, that I can think of. I mean, really our Hopkins students such uh, so many leaders, so many young leaders who could occupy that role. The other thing that uh, occurs to me is that I've had two kids who have uh, regularly uh, caught the bus, but then there have been months of just not doing that, driving them instead. And I can tell you the, the, on the high school side of things, um, oftentimes those buses are not uh, not that full. <laughs> Students are driving themselves to school. They're getting a ride 10 minutes before school begins. Um, I, I, you know, people might have in mind that these buses will be packed with, you know, juniors and seniors and, and kindergarten students, but it's just not going to work out that way. Um, it, that's not going to be how our town utilizes the bus system. So I think it makes a whole lot of sense. And COVID has shown us the benefits of our students being able to go to school at a reasonable hour and not have to get up an hour beforehand to catch a bus. Um, so I'd love to see us be able to move as the research points us to move, which is to have a later start time. Yeah, this, I strongly support that. I think in Amherst, it's actually nine o'clock for the high school students. At Northampton, it's nine o'clock for the high school students, 8.30 for the middle school students. So clearly they know something, right? And so I think the rest of the country knows something that this bill from the state to set up a commission to explore this. Uh, when we lived in New Zealand, they, the kids started at 9.30 or 10 o'clock uh, and they went just a little bit longer. And it was amazing the, the difference in performance at school. Those first few classes, my kids, I think actually paid attention, which is shocking. So uh, yeah, if we can, I think, it sounds like we've got some creative ideas, hopefully, where we could address. I know the concerns that have been raised. I'd hope we can address the concerns that are raised about the busing. So I'm assuming Amherst and Northampton are doing a, a double bus system since they're larger. Do you know, Annie? Yeah, I think they still, they still have multiple tiers of buses. And um, they may, I can find out for you. As a matter of fact, Dr. Morris was kind enough to even send me the details. So he had given those to me. I just can't recall that what they are right now, but they may have done some flipping, right? So to keep multiple tiers and then they're having elementary start earlier and high school start later. So they yeah. could have just flipped the tiers. I think our challenge, right, one of the challenges are 
middle and high schools will be together. Right? And so we would, we would have to have one set time for them. And right now those are what, 725, seven yes. high school? Yeah, Hopkins starts at 725 roughly. I think about 728 or something like that, or 722, somewhere right around there. I have two comments. Um, uh, one would be, I think, um, from an elementary school um, perspective, um, one thing that would jump out as, as a parent of an elementary school student, um, I would imagine others are thinking this too, is thinking about changing the times of the um, start and stop for the elementary school might bring um, a little bit of angst um, if they're going to shift too much. I'm just thinking about how Elementary school is already a, a bit challenging as far as time goes for working parents. So if kids are getting out earlier because they're going to school earlier, that might be a challenge for some parents to coordinate after school care. Just a thought. So I didn't know where that kind of shaped out as far as start and stop times for the elementary school. Um, and then the other thing that might be useful if we have that information is to kind of tack on to what Humera said. It's a good point that a lot of high schoolers, when the older they get, the less they're on the bus, they're going with friends, they're getting dropped off, they're driving themselves. Um, so having a general idea, maybe being able to share um, in um, the superintendent newsletter, roughly, again, I know I like numbers, but uh, roughly an idea of like what percentage of kids in the high schooler have historically been using the bus. I know this past year is just different in general, but historically, what have we seen for numbers for nine through 12 or even 10 through 12? Are we seeing mostly seventh and eighth graders? Because maybe parents, I don't know, feel more comfortable if they know their third grader is on a bus with a seventh grader, they might bring them more ease than an 11th or 12th. I don't know. I'm just thinking that maybe it would help to know kind of the age groups that are on the bus as a general rule. I can just say, Tara, to your first comment that the, and it doesn't mean it's the only way. One of the things we were talking about last time that was the, um, that had the advantage of being cost effective, providing minimal disruption to elementary staff and families. There's not that much of a change. Your Hopkins drop-off would still be first then the elementary drop-off. So it may change by 10 minutes um, or so, but not significant. We weren't talking about a flipped tier because I'll say again, the other advantage given a district our size is that now to do whole district collaboration after school, certainly Hopkins teachers, all of our teachers are always working, but they, any, any committee that starts, any work that starts Hopkins, it's an hour after Hopkins has dismissed. So facilitates increased teacher collaboration, which is a priority for a district as well. Again, I wanna underscore for staff who are watching, the community, we're just picking up a conversation that came to a screeching halt when the world shut down and kind of trying to remember where we were in that conversation and reminding people if they have strong thoughts, feelings, or questions to reach out directly to me to principals or to a school committee member. I think it's a great reminder. Um, I do think, you know, we should keep the momentum on this, right? Get, just given what's happening around us. Um, so bringing it back in May for a discussion and then um, assuming this requires a vote uh, at a, you know, June meeting, uh, something that will allow us to have that clarity uh, for the start of the school year well in advance of that. Okay. I have one other question that's not related, kind of sort of related. I know that we had put after school kind of on hold um, given past interest in it in the elementary school. Um, I'm wondering if there has been any further discussion about whether or not it's, we're gonna attempt or if there's any guidelines to attempting after school again in the fall. In the fall, absolutely. What we were still on the fence about was whether or not we could offer anything for the end of this year. So in this assume Hadley Kids is completely functioning in the fall, people will probably start hearing from Director Frost regarding enrollments. So assume that that is completely functioning in the fall. 
unless something unexpected happens, right? So unless something unforeseen were to happen, assume it is. The question was, could we offer anything for the end of the year? And um, that's, I'm not saying it's completely off the table. I don't know how meaningful it is for parents at this point. And, um, and also we've been trying to work out full days and lunches, right? So our priority when we went to full days was making sure that cafeteria was clean, ready, safe, and, but so that was, but definitely the fall, people should assume in the fall that uh, Hadley gets up and running. I also would like to take a moment just to highlight that we have extended um, before school, just for a couple of minutes to be able to have students come into the building earlier. Um, so we do have um, staff that supervises students now at 815. So um, it's helped incredibly our drop off lines in the morning and getting students in for direct instruction by the first bell, which is 825, 830. So I just wanted to say that, that we're, we, we understand that it's been difficult for families to drop off um, and try to get to work at nine o'clock um, within 825, opening up the doors for everybody. So um, just wanted to say that. Great. All right. I think our next topic then is um, to move into the review of the public health data. Yeah, and uh, so good news. Uh, I do realize I have to update the numbers in terms of how many students are, uh, how many people are in person and remote. Um, uh, we had one additional confirmed positive case, uh, I think shortly before break, I informed, I can't remember when I sent the email out, but it's one that the entire community was informed of. Um, and that came, we were able to identify that through pool testing. So we're very grateful for that. Um, and then the vaccine rates, I will be updating this as well for you. I believe at this point that our vaccine, um, our vaccine rates among faculty and staff are much higher. So my follow-up survey will be just to teachers and educational support professionals, because I believe I have all of the data on administration, uh, custodial food service, um, and admin support. And that is almost at 100%. And so then I'll get um, the remaining data and update this. The good news is that things are starting to trend or have been trending in the right direction. And um, that's good news for the entire Commonwealth and certainly for the schools. Annie, Annie, on the faculty uh, vaccinated, is it, are you hearing of any impediment? I mean, everybody should be able to get a vaccine if right. they want, right? So. so initially the impediments, and thank goodness, we have a number of staff and faculty who are extremely helpful to um, other staff and faculty because they were good at getting online and getting appointments. So the, the only impediment initially was just trying to get an appointment. Um, so, as I said, my, I'm going to send a follow up to th those two groups, but I can tell you everybody outside of teacher educational support professionals, it would appear that um, people aren't having impediments to getting vaccines. Okay. Great. Thanks. That's good. Can you explain just what the difference is between second dose and fully vaccinated? Is that time? Yeah. It's that two weeks after. Okay. This is yet another example of Annie McKenzie's phenomenal survey design and asking questions, right? <laughs> so, so it was uh, when at the time of the survey, Johnson & Johnson was online. It's back online now, I think, as of today. Um, but so have you had a first dose? Did you have two of two fully vaccinated was your 15th day after that second dose? So we had some people that um, had two doses, but they weren't yet considered fully vaccinated. Got it, thank you. Any other questions on this? All right, Chris, I hope you've finished your dinner because it's time for the business manager report. I was gonna delay a little bit just to uh, give the impression that I was still eating my dinner, but I haven't actually eaten it yet. So uh, uh, let's see. We can start off with the expense report. Um, really, again, as was last month, not a lot of surprises here. Um, anything that we've seen 
for extra expenses we've known about for a while. Um, and you know, looking at the bottom line at the end of the year, um, we have about $2.1 million remaining to spend. A good amount of that is obviously going to go to payroll, but we still have um, a substantial amount that we can put towards school choice, about 300,000 of that. And uh, today I just finished with the town um, transferring expenses to them for the rest of the COVID expenses that we had put on our books, but were supposed to go toward the town side. So we were just waiting until we uh, used up all those funds. It's another $77,000 that will be freed up in our budget as a result of that. Um, and uh, that's that's pretty much it as far as news. I can certainly answer any questions anyone might have. None from me. Okay. Um, then we could just jump over to the grants report. Um, most of the COVID money that needs to be spent has been spent. There's still some funds remaining, um, but just in looking through expenses today, I was able to find basically enough to use up all of the 102 and 113 grants just by transferring expenses out of the regular budget where they had gone into these grant accounts. So uh, those two will be used up. Uh, we're kind of waiting for the ESSER two. We're not going to use any of that in this fiscal year. And um, ESSER three is still kind of on the horizon, um, but it won't be used this fiscal year either. Uh, the rest of the grants, Basically, at any point in time, I could do the transfers um, over to use the rest of these funds. The one um, item, and it, it's really going to kind of depend on how the year goes, it would be helpful if we could carry over a little extra circuit breaker funds. We're limited as to how much we can actually um, carry over. We can only carry over what we've received that year. So once we get the final tally of what we're going to receive for this year, we can see how much we can carry over into next year. But, you know, with the nature of special ed expenses, it's always helpful to have, um, you know, some money put aside in case we get a, an unexpected expense or something that we need to cover. So um, we're, we're kind of just holding off on that one, but it is another certain amount of money that we have available to us if needed. Um, and then the rest of the grants, you know, again, some of these like Title One, we have one salary going to it every two weeks. So, um, you know, that will get used up by the end of the year. The other ones, I will just transfer expenses to probably um, before the next meeting. I will do that just to use up those grants. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Okay. And last up, we have the revolving accounts report. Not a whole lot of changes really in these accounts. Um, I, I, you know, as as expected, the preschool account is uh, still trending negative. Obviously, um, we will fix that by the end of the school year. Uh, the rest of the accounts, you know, pretty much staying the same. Uh, you know, lunch is going down. Um, that's one of those items that when we get payments. Typically the, the uh, July and August payments are very small because of the nature of, well, there's only half of, of the school year in June or half of the month in June, say to use. Um, because this year with all of the free lunches that were offered, we're going to make more. So I do expect that we'll see some growth um, this year in terms of the balance in the lunch account over the summer, which is certainly nice to see. Um, uh, but basically that's about it. I don't know if anybody has any questions about the revolving accounts. Chris, was the lunch, um, funding extended through the 21, 22 year? It was just this past week. Yeah. Yeah. That's great news. That is great news. Certainly. So I, I hadn't heard that. So free lunch for the next year or two. Mm -hmm. So federally funded. Wow. Yeah. That's a big deal. I mean, not only for our district, but basically for the entire country. Uh, you know, that's, yeah. that's going to be a big help. So wow. nice to see. All right. Any so other can't, questions? We can't, make, uh, can't give you a hard time about that deficit anymore, Chris? 
Is that right? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm actually enjoying this. It's uh, it's, it's kind of nice. There's no chance for Anne to steal my thunder like she has done uh, the past couple of years. So <laughs> keeping that balance in the positive is a plus. And so the school choice number keeps going up, right, as we get uh, contributions from other towns. But then at what, what point is, uh, are we taking out our allocation from that? What do we do? Um, I typically do that. Uh, I date it June 30th, but it actually happens um, in July or August, uh, you know, we we kind of let the dust settle. We close out any remaining purchase orders that might be kind of hanging or, or you know, around that aren't needed. Um, there is a massive flurry of activity between, say, the last week of June and the first two weeks of Ju uh, July to really chase down any bills that we have remaining. Um, the last, I would say, four or five years, we haven't had any bills that we had to roll over into the next fiscal year. So, it's, it's certainly a lot nicer to have that. And once the dust settles and we close all of those out, then we can do the final transfer of school choice funds into the budget. So it, it will continue to grow and then it will take a, a good size drop of uh, probably three to $400,000 um, in July, I guess. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I have a question. Does sure. The the funding for the school lunches, is that only through the school year or is there money for summer for students to get lunches? Typically we don't serve lunches in the summer. So it's typically we get funding, but it's, it's the May and June bills that show up in July and August. Um, I'm assuming that we're going to actually serve lunches this summer. So what will end up happening is those funds will show up in September and October. Everything's a, a month or two behind always when we get reimbursed for it, um, but we will be seeing larger reimbursements for the summer lunches in September and October. Okay, any other questions for Chris? All right. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Thank you. See you next month. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to move into the school committee reports um, and discussion items. Humera, the collaborative. You're on mute, Humera. Of course I am. <laughs> um, the uh, collaborative is uh, going through a strategic planning process and also um, bringing on a new, uh, working to bring on a new executive director. So that all that is in progress. Uh, I think I mentioned to you last time that um, the collaborative uh, has the contract for the Department of Youth Services and as a result is responsible for professional development for many, many educators throughout the state. And I was lucky enough because I asked uh, to be invited to a, uh, a day long professional development uh, conference they held called Racial Trauma Conference, um, Culturally and Historically Responsive Teaching. Um, Cultivating Genius was the workshop that I attended by Dr. Goldie Muhammad. And um, there were some really important takeaways that I, a few of which I just wanna share here with you. Um, and that is the importance of um, uh, cultivating genius in young black, brown and um, people of color, um, students, uh, children of color. Um, and really starting with a lot of uh, role models. Uh, there have been, um, there's uh, the fundamental um, uh, un or understanding by researchers is that there's been an erasure of a lot of um, uh, people who have been successful uh, educators, uh, inventors, business uh, people, uh, and thinkers. And so really uh, finding ways to build that back um, into the curriculum for all students to realize that um, there's um, uh, that that kind of educational attainment and uh, uh, cultivation of capability is within all of us, regardless of race. Um, there were some pretty um, uh, 
amazing uh, aspects to the education um, that we received, including um, really putting a spotlight on pedagogy. It's seven o'clock. And the way in which we teach um, uh, and how we teach and building um, uh, joy uh, into the teaching and building active learning um, into the teaching of these, um, uh, uh, into the teaching of just about any subject. Uh, and that really doesn't have to do with race or role models or um, the works of art and who define those works of art, but it really has to do with um, uh, thinking about what's not working in how we teach. The how we teach is important for all learners. And um, that's uh, really important, especially for learners of color who are, um, uh, who are um, not um, responding well to uh, the ways in which education has been, um, has been taught for uh, one specific kind of learner. Um, to date. Um, one specific uh, slide in this um, relates back to a comment earlier from the, um, uh, the uh, community member in open comment. Uh, what is the difference between non-racist and anti-racist um, education or the non-racist versus anti-racist racist educator? Um, and it really requires us to ask uh, the following three things. Does your curriculum and instruction help to cultivate the child who, one, contributes to others hurt, harm, or pain. Uh, two, is silent to others hurt, harm, or pain. And three, actively feels and disrupts others hurt, harm, or pain. And uh, if, if we are truly um, looking at um, these teachings as a way to minimize others hurt, harm, or pain, and to not contribute, but rather ameliorate, um, then it's definitely worth um, taking a look at what the research is saying about this kind of education. So those are some of the things that um, that I took away from the conference. It's just a, um, a thumbnail sketch. Um, I could go on for, uh, for, for a long time. Um, but uh, one other educator I wanna bring your attention to is someone at, um, at uh, UMass Amherst. It turns out that we have a, an incredible um, uh, uh, educator here whose name is Jamila Lyascott, and she's the Assistant Professor of Social Justice Education at UMass Amherst, co-director of the Center for Racial Justice and Youth Engaged Research. Um, and she, um, her, the title of her talk was your teaching might be more aligned with colonialism than you and then you realize and that was what she was asked to speak about not what the not the topic that she chose to speak about um so i was really proud of our state for um being out front on these issues as it relates to statewide um education for youths of color i think it really relates back to the work that we're doing in hadley and i'm i'm proud that we are continuing to ask the right questions um, as it relates to this work Thank you, Humira. That's a great update. Appreciate it. All right, um, Ethan, anything on the finance front other than the budget we just talked through? No, that's it. I, I know that Annie presented a couple of weeks ago to the, the town, um, but that's the only update that we have as of now. All right, um, policy. So we have a updated policy on IHBEA R2. Tara? I'm sorry, I can also, because I, I think I threw a monkey wrench in here, Tara, so I'll let you speak, but normally I want to remind people, we normally do two readings, um, but the reason I'm asking the school committee to approve on the first reading is because the changes are minor. It is one policy, minor, minor changes that are now aligned with the law, and uh, this was something when the department came in and did our audit in Title III specifically directed us to do. Um, so sorry, that was a bit of a Monkey Rich, usually it's two readings. I didn't have anything to add, just that we reviewed that last time and there were minor changes. Got it. So this is our initial read, no action required, but if folks have... No, I'm sorry. I am asking if the school committee, even though it's one reading because it's one policy, if the school committee would consider approving it tonight. Again, I want to say the state came in and said... our 
previous policy had the wrong information um, and it was aligned with previous standards for exiting children from English language programs. So we had it that they had to have a comprehensive, a composite literacy score, literacy score of five. The law, the regs actually say it's a 4.2 overall and a 3.9 composite literacy. So that's the change. Um, and the state has asked us to make the change and it would help me greatly if the school committee would approve the change tonight so I can send the amended policy to the state. So I propose to make the change as uh, recommended. Seconded. All in favor. Aye. 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 All right. Um, okay, and then fields and capital, Paul. So on fields, uh, hopefully folks have been able to get out and see the, the new fields that are out there. I think they're this month or soon after we'll be closing out that first phase with Amasta. They still have some obligations that they need to close out. They're sort of a punch list that we need to go through. There's a new well system, all that needs to be checked. I think they might reseed some of the grass. Um, there's benches that need to be updated. So there's still a bit of work to do in that first phase, but I know they're, they're working on it. And then I've asked to get an estimate, uh, early estimate from the Brookshire design on the second phase. And I'm, I'll start reaching out and planning to, to meet with CPA and even Conservation Commission just to give them an update to say, here's how the first day phrase went. And I think it looks really great. I was out there this weekend for a soccer game and, um, you know, we can't use the new fields yet, but everything that's up, the backstops are up for the softball and, bat and baseball. Looks really good. And I see there's a lot of use on that track. So I actually think it might, if we could ever find a way to document daily use, because I hear a lot of community members use it. And I think as we start thinking about the second phase and tapping into uh, future CPA money, hopefully, be good to know whether the first phase is getting used by beyond the school. I use it every day. So yeah, nice. Awesome. It's good to hear. I do see some snowmobile damage out there, to be honest, um, but we tried hard not to have that happen. And I, I, I worked with the snowmobile association here and they, they were great. Uh, and I know, you know, it was not their desire to have any snowmobile use. And I imagine it's hard in the middle of the night if you're going by to know what's on the the asphalt or not, and we've got some ideas about how to preclude that next season. That's great. It's looking really good. Yeah. Excellent. That's it. Um, the only other thing, Annie, I was going to ask you, since it's kind of under capital or buildings, um, if you wanted to mention the MSBA letter we received, I think it was last week. Yes, so I'm going to try again. Uh, third time, maybe it's the charm. So we will resubmit for, and every time I did this last year, I called them. I said, what can we do to make the application stronger? I, uh, Chris and I both spoke with um, our contact, our liaison at Mass School Building Authority. We made those changes and um, wasn't strong enough. So I will go back up to the plate. I will do this until I retire. I'm telling you, I'm like <laughs> trying to puzzle any. This is for uh, the renovation of the girls' locker room and the heating, heating ventilation. We repaired everything, but this is wholesale replacement of the HVAC system at Hopkins. I'll keep trying. I'll do it after I retire. I will do this every year. <laughs> I will come back just to write your MSBA proposal <laughs> to give it to you. Thank you, Annie. Sure. All right. I have a question. Did we, were we skipping over 5C from today? I might have missed that. Did we, we, talk we did talk about the advisory um, that uh, has that as now a holiday. No, the, it, um, maybe I have an old agenda. It says music instruction, AGS. Do I have an old? You do. Sorry, it was updated in the, um, in the file. So no, oh, there isn't an update on music instruction at HES. So my apologies for that. There that's was, my yeah, it changed. Okay, thanks for asking, Dara. Thanks. All right. Um, so moving into announcements, the only thing uh, I was just going to mention was again, congratulations, Paul and Humera. You both uh, re ran for school committee and were elected back uh, for another three year 
uh, term. So thank you again for re I actually never officially heard. I assumed we, we, I won, we won. We were since we were running. I post. saw it. I saw it posted online somewhere. So it must oh, okay. Be um, <laughs> no, right. I'm pretty, I, I did want to thank you for that. Congratulate you both for that. Um, and I did want to mention, I do think that in our May meeting, um, we do need to have an agenda item for the school committee organization of the chair, um, the vice chair, and appointments to all of the subcommittees, warrant approvals, just the, you know, the shakeup that we do every year to just make sure that folks are assigned to the, the groups that they are part, um, that they want to be part of and give folks an opportunity to perhaps, um, you know, go into an area that they hadn't been part of before. So Annie, thank we can plan to do that in May. Yeah, thank you. I completely forgot until you said it. I just wrote it down. We have to do the uh, reorg, so we will do it in May. We normally do it in April. And uh, Amy Parsons is now, Jane Nevin Smith texted me, um, thanked all of you for um, making her feel welcome as the liaison from the select board. She's still on the select board, but Amy Parsons, new select board member is now the liaison to the school department. So I'll make sure that she gets the calendar invites and all the information and we look forward to having her. That's wonderful. And as I understand it, she is an alum of yeah. Hopkins. Is she not? She's an alum. That's terrific. Happy to have her on the team. How long do you guys Any other announcements for tonight? All right, we've got a couple action items and then we do have executive session. Um, so first is, is there a motion to approve the minutes? I believe we get some corrected minutes as well. So minutes for March 8th, 21 and March 29th, 21. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, is there an, a motion to approve the accounts payable warrants for March 21? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 I will abstain. Uh, and then the motion to approve the warrants, payroll warrants for March 21? So moved. So moved. Second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstain? I actually, I'm going to ask for a revote on that. I'm sorry, Mr. Fiverr, you're going to abstain from this. Oh, is this one? This yeah. one. Yeah. Sorry, I know it's confusing. Heather does abstains from the warrant, uh, the AP warrant, you abstain from this one. So could you just sorry. redo the vote? No problem. I'll motion it. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstention? Aye. Great. Okay. Um, we're going to go into session for the budget piece. Uh, we already approved the calendar. Um, and we approved the policy. So before we adjourn our meeting, just a note to folks, um, our next meeting will be May 24th, uh, 5.30. That is the week of graduation. Okay. All right. May is right around the corner. Um, is, is there a motion to move into executive session to discuss strategy sessions in preparation for negotiation with non-union personnel and to reconvene an open session? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, is this a roll call vote, Annie? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, Paul? Yes. Tara? Yes. Humera? Aye. Ethan? Yes. Is there a motion to reconvene an open session? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, is there a motion to uh, actually, Annie? What what exactly is the motion here? The Approval motion? of the FY twenty two budget. The the budget presentation you had tonight simply an approval of the budget. Yep. Motion to approve the fiscal year twenty twenty two budget. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, great, motion passes. We look forward to uh, having the budget be part of town meeting in terms of the annual the town contribution. So thank you. Um, that's it for tonight. Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion to adjourn. Second. 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 
All in favor. Aye. 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 Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Thank you. You guys have a great night. Take care. Bye. Good night.